When uh, Maria and I planned this uh, little series of talks about the future of cinema, our idea was to take in the middle of the three-part series a closer look at the core of our business. On one hand, worldwide distribution, and on the other hand, local exhibition of cinema films. After a process of 25 years of technical digitalization, starting with the sound and um, editing process, followed by post-production and the shooting process, finally, the cinemas were digitalized. And that with an enormous speed in Europe with big help from governments and funding agencies. It was the biggest upheaval <clears throat> in film exhibition since synchronized sound in the 30s of last century. For almost 80 years, we worked with a worldwide standi stand sorry, standardized technical process and a standard business model, which did not undergo big changes after it got acquainted with the TV industry 60 years ago. Between 2010 and 2014, the world's film industries forever changed the way movies were shown. It looked to me as if everybody was saying, let's go over with it fast, then we can return to business as, as usual. But as we all know, it's the contrary. Return to business as usual. No, now the real changes just are about to start. And in comparison with the last big change sound, this change is much more difficult to anticipate as everything looks for the makers and the audience more or less alike. We don't see a big change on the screen, but that's only the look from the outside. I'm convinced that with the digitalization of the audience's reception, nothing will remain unaffected. No craft will work in old skills. No one in this business can re really rely on former experiences. Just to show the big polls in this discussion, two quotes I found in the trades in the last days. In the annual gathering of the communal cinemas, in Kommunalkinos, Stefan Drössler, director of the Film Museum in Munich, stressed the importance of the traditional role of cinemas and objected very strongly the, he said, permanent interactivity of cinema events, in which the movies are just a means to the end as discussions and live events while the classic cinema screenings loses, lose their singleness. On the other hand, Paul Schrader, writer and author, most of you know him for writing um, a very famous film, Taxi Driver, in contrast has no problems with this. He said yesterday, everything's up for grabs. It's exciting in that way, unless you are wedded to the 20th century concept of a projected image in a dark room in front of a paying audiences. If you are wedded to that concept, you are in trouble because that concept is dead. Disregarding towards which sides you are leaning, the fact that the cinema film and the cinema itself are not an aesthetic unity anymore, all this seems to be irreversible. The audience is now everywhere, every time, on every screen, and sometimes even in the cinema. Maria and I thought it might be good, a good idea to invite and ask people from the forward edge of this battle area to share their experience in the last years. So we are very grateful and happy to welcome two people tonight. Uh, first of all, Rike Ennis, who is CNO, CEO of Trust Nordisk, the sales agency, which amongst many other films distributes Lars von Trier's films. Good evening, Rike. And the second um, half of tonight we will listen to and discuss with John Baronetschier, who is the project development manager of the British non-chain cinema chain, Picture House Cinemas. I think he will later explain why it is important to be a non-chain chain. John is working in the forefront of digital exhibition, probably the most volatile piece in our art and business model, now entering the new age. Good evening, John. So we have two presentations, and the idea is after Rike's um, presentation, uh, we thought it's a good idea to allow a couple of questions directly uh, to Ennis, 
Vika Ennis' speech, and then after John's statement uh, to John's speech, before then we hope to get into a good discussion with both of you and the audience. Have fun, and I wish everybody a nice evening. Thank you very much. Well, Trust Nordisk. A very short introduction of uh, who I am and Trust Nordisk. We are an international sales agent uh, represented on pretty much all uh, A festivals that you have around the world and TV markets. These are some of them. So uh, from a catalog of around 20 uh, films a year or a lineup of 20 films, I would say that around 17 to 18 of those are represented on these festivals here. So you have, of course, the one that you know well, Berlinale, Sundance, and Toronto, and Cannes, and so forth. We have actually a catalog of 650 titles that we are eagerly trying to distribute worldwide via iTunes, but we do have some challenges. Uh, talk to you about that later. Okay, so the types of films we are representing uh, is mainly Nordic content, uh, we have uh, Nordic blockbusters, which is uh, mainly strong Nordic IP, uh, where you have a Nordic story uh, and where we, for example, it could be a new, uh, the wave uh, that's coming out next year, where you have like a local domestic story that all Norwegians knows about, but where we think it has potential internationally as well. Auteur films, Lars von Trier, we represent all of Lars von Trier's films. Susanne Bier, Thomas Winterberg, Pierre Flü, Lone Scherfi are some of the directors that we represent. Then we also represent bestsellers. A good example is uh, Headhunters, a book by Jo Nesper, based on a book. We like that a lot because you have the books to refer to. And lately, actually also to John's company, we sold The Keeper of Lost Courses uh, based on Jussi Adler Olsen's books. Thrillers works well internationally. Uh, we also sell action adventures, uh, festival pearls that are typically for first, second time directors, and that goes straight to uh, festivals. And then uh, a phenomenon that is growing by the day, TV series. We will also talk a little bit about that later, uh, but something that is getting very, very hot and trendy among uh, the most, uh, you could say, acclaimed directors. Okay, so, I mean, sometimes when you talk about today's challenges, it sounds like we are repeating itself. We've been hearing this for ages, that, you know, of course, DVD sales are dropping, all of us here know that. Uh, the only DVDs that actually sells today are like the big blockbusters, so when you're standing in the queue in the supermarket, you just grab the, the DVD that you didn't uh, get to say, see in the cinemas. That's great, we all know that, but for the smaller films, the market is really decreasing a lot. VOD, that was the answer that everybody talked about 10 years ago, this is going to save us in the future. Let's just face it, it's not really there yet. The numbers that we are losing on DVD are not there in VOD. So, everybody has been talking for a long while about this long tail that when everything becomes available on the internet and on VOD platforms, then it's just a walk in the park will be there. But that's not how it is in the, in the real world. SVOD. Yes, indeed, it's amazing. We have Netflix, we have HBO, Viaplay, we have so many SVOD uh, platforms, but there is no economy in it. Actually, I have uh, quite a good example uh, from AFM just a few months ago that um, Tarantino's new films from Weinstein was actually in negotiation with Netflix. Weinstein had a huge amount coming up from Netflix and wanted the distributors to put a place an offer of uh, the film with SVOD rights and one without it. So they actually tr tried to, as one of the groundbreaking or the, the first ones ever, to make a deal with Netflix directly and sell the distribution rights, all rights, but without the the SVOD rights. It did not go that well, I can tell you, because pretty much 
everyone, all the distributors said, we will only deliver one offer on the table, and that is including the SVOD rights. So it didn't go that well for Weinstein, but of course everybody else has been following that negotiation because that will mean that if we as a sales agent can go out and actually sell uh, the VOD and SVOD rights beforehand and then deal with the rest of the rights, then there is a new business case. But honestly, I don't believe it in, in it myself. Um, you have so much more films uh, on this market. You have a lot of competition. And it seems like more films than ever are being produced. But however, the financing is so much harder. The same production companies are just struggling to get the financing done and we only have a certain amount of money to go after. So it's definitely not getting uh, any easier to finance. That means a greater risk for the production company, a company like Centropa that before perhaps could have an own equity of a few hundred thousand euros in, it, in its uh, project, they would have perhaps five to ten times as much now. And that means they are the last ones to recoup their money. So once the cinemas have taken their share, the distributors, the funds, and the local distribution company has recouped their MG, you have so little left. I mean, so it really does not make sense to produce films unless you can actually earn a lot of money actually producing the film in-house. Um, and also, whenever we have been trying to be a little bit creative, and, and do like find new ways of, of distributing our films by VOD, uh, day and date in Denmark and so forth, and even international. It seems like you know everyone is holding on to their old uh, distribution system, and everyone is, you could say, representing their own company. So. From a Nordic uh, perspective, you have like Nordisk film owning the cinemas, and the cinema chain, of course, would do everything they can to not have a day and date or premium VOD uh, release because that would, or at least they think, it would mess with their turnover in the cinemas. And the distribution department, of course, are very, very afraid of, of trying to mix up the windows. So it's, it's a great challenge there. From uh, the political side, you have Creative Europe doing a lot of wonderful new uh, initiatives, no doubt about that. Uh, but some of them are actually, I think, a little bit too creative. It actually uh, messes up with the, the whole business plan of uh, all that we know of, of today and the, you could say the business case that we sometimes try to hang on to. And um, what they're trying to do, of course, is to just break down the barriers in order to have one single market, which is, of course, a great idea, but unfortunately for the film market today, it does not work. As a sales agent, what we live from is earning MGs from each territory, and the day you break down those barriers, you will not have any exclusivity anymore, and that's going to just miss uh, out the whole business case. Um, that we already have seen with the physical DVD, of course, uh, where once you have released a DVD, it's out there and you cannot do anything about it, but now they really want to do that as well uh, with the digital world. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's a great idea, but it, just do it does not work uh, in principle as it is right now. Um, so, any solutions to this? Well, wouldn't it be nice uh, if we could have a simultaneous release of, for example, a Lars von Trier film, uh, almost like Hollywood films, where you have like uh, a simultaneous release within one week, or even sometimes on the same date? Uh, that would be a true unification of Europe. The problem is, it's never going to happen. I mean, here in Germany, would you ever go see a Danish blockbuster because it's Danish and it was released on that specific day 
all over the world? I don't think so. So the reason why Hollywood is so successful is because you would actually choose a Hollywood film instead of a German local film. So let's face it, that is never going to happen. I mean, if we are lucky, we might be able to do kind of like a short window of two months where we have like an international release of our films. But the case that I will show you next, which is Nymphomaniac, shows that it is very tough, although you have a strong director like Lars von Trier, that you can have the best intentions, but you know it doesn't really necessarily work the way you, you want it to. Creative Europe, they do some great support right now, and they have some new initiatives of uh, supporting uh, the material costs, which are quite huge if you have a, a big catalog, and they support 50% of those expenses if you can come up with a catalog, I think, of 30 films. Uh, and they also help you, um, you know, or they will uh, help with the marketing expenses, which are so expensive when you have to go out there on iTunes uh, internationally. So the DOP uh, and the digital files um, would definitely be a great help. Central regulation is another way that they can actually interfere, uh, but I don't think uh, it would be a very popular commissioner uh, that will come out and say, you know what, guys, I know what the best solution is in Germany and Denmark or wherever. I think you should just forget about those windows and we just go day and date with everything. I mean, that would definitely be suicide for a commissioner, so uh, that will not happen as well. So, I mean... I'm writing here just for the fun of it, a uh, new world cinema model, uh, and actually that is uh, quite a new initiative we're working on right now, and it's actually mainly uh, to be tried out at the Chinese market, because you have, well, you actually have a few dialects there, three dialects I think it is, uh, but you have a huge digital market, so it's just interesting to see how it works there. But the whole idea is that if this works, it's a little bit like a, a social network model where you stream film uh, to people and where any device, any website can actually be the host of a film. And you could stream it. So that would a little bit be like if I'm a fan of Lars von Trier and his film Europe. I cannot find it on iTunes in that specific country I'm in. Uh, if I can host that film, I'm allowed to pass it on to my friends, like a social network page, and actually receive some of the money coming in from this uh, specific uh, film streaming. And of course, what is very important here is that 50% of the revenues would come back to the rights holder to produce new films. I mean, everything is just on really on a trying stage right now, uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, in six months' time, we will know more whether it works. That's a huge challenge when it comes to dub and languages and so forth in Europe. But what I would find interesting, if in any way possible, is that you can pass the geo blocking. So, let's say that I'm sitting in in Czech Republic. I'm looking for a specific film. It's not available because no Czech. Uh, distributor bought it in, in uh, the Czech Republic, if I actually can access you know, the film in Germany, in English of course, because there is no Czech dub, then the rights holder in Germany would get part of the fee that I, when I watch the fee, or <laughs> watch the film. So it's a little bit complicated perhaps to explain without you know, uh, drawing it and stuff like that, but that's something we're working on now. If it works, I do think it, it will make a difference, but time will show. So, let's go uh, forward to uh, the case of Nymphomaniac, and, and how did that all start? Um, well, let's put it that way. We have a crazy uh, director called Lars von Trier that decided, uh, actually I think it was two and a half, three years ago, uh, to make a film uh, that was in his head, First, he had an idea to make it as like a small little Danish film where he just tried out his wildest thoughts. But Peter Olbeck, that some of you might know, the CEO, he said, you know, what the heck? It's a funny theme, Nymphomaniacs. Everybody wants to see Nymphomaniacs. I mean, so why not big, make it a big scale film? Uh, eight, nine million euros, let's go for it. But we had this little... Uh, problem that uh, Lars said, you know, with all that is in my mind, I think it's going to be a long film. Okay, so what's a long film, like two and a half, three hours, max? Well, I wrote a script now, and it's about 450 pages, and I don't want to cut a single minute out of it. 
Okay, so that's a good start. Um, so what do we do about that? Well, uh, it's not exactly a commercial uh, subject, uh, nymphomaniacs. Uh, it's quite controversial. And definitely, I mean, for the Catholic countries, we uh, could look forward to seeing a few uh, issues there in terms of censorships. Um, so we, you know, instead of uh, being negative about it all and just realizing we're talking about Lars von Trier, let's just try to look at this in a more positive way. So, we made a little creative think tank and tried to turn weakness into strength. So, there was a few, uh, you could say, topics we had to uh, relate to in this respect, and that was, first of all, the marketing of the film. How could we market a film that would, on the outside, look very tiny, very small, and very, very niche? We would have to make a kick-ass press strategy around it, and we need to, needed to think seriously about that. As you all know, uh, Lars, he was not exactly uh, popular in Cannes. Uh, he was persona non grata after his uh, amazing uh, and stupid uh, talks in Cannes uh, last time. So, I mean, Cannes was just out of the equation. We didn't even talk to Ken, and, and I can actually verify that, although people do not believe it. We did not want to return to Ken, even though he was not persona non grata anymore. But I'm getting back to that uh, a little bit later. Uh, so, uh, we had this uh, amazing guy called Philip Lipski um, that did several campaigns in Denmark for a local film called Clown. I think actually it was also released here in... Uh, in Denmark to make a marketing campaign and as you can see when you look at it it's like whoa what is that but actually it was very effective the printed poster like I think you all know what it represents here and people were like discussing that uh, a lot on the net uh, what that represented and why we chose that specific poster and it's amazing how many lines and how much text you can get out of something very very simple and this here was actually Lars' own idea, the ensemble still, that he just had an image of all the actors in the film lining up for this ensemble still in the most weird uh, positions. And of course Lars said, I don't care what I do as long as I have like a tape on my mouth. Then you can do whatever you want with the rest. So that we did. So that was kind of like the first step uh, of the marketing campaign. And the film was released uh, on the 25th of December last year. And uh, I think the marketing campaign started, you know, almost eight, no, eight more than that, 12 months before uh, the release. So we started, you know, even before the production uh, started, we started doing the marketing of the film. So this was... Uh, Definitely, probably what you know best from Nymphomaniac, and um, that was Philip Lipski's idea to do these uh, orgasm posters. And everyone said to him, you know what, ha that's not going to happen. I mean, you, you will not have these actors come uh, and make these orgasm posters. Ca how can they? I mean, it's unacceptab un unacceptable. But uh, they did. They came, and uh, I think they pretty did a pretty good job. And... Uh, <laughs> Well, it, it, it works. And actually what the funny part is, you know that it has really worked when journalists and uh, critics, they are doing uh, the same thing. I mean, that's when you know you've uh, made a success. And what we actually did at our Trust Nordisk party on Sunday, we made a photo booth uh, where you could do your own photos, uh, your orgasm photos, and I'm telling you, People were lining up in a queue of like, yeah, 200 meters to have that own photo uh, in there, that very weird position. That was quite fun. Um, and that's, this ended up actually being the main posters um, in most of the countries. There was a few others used. Uh, I actually know that the one in the middle I saw in Beijing two weeks ago. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that one, but that was a piracy uh, DVD, of course. But they chose the one in the middle, and um, 
it was sold out when I actually asked uh, for a D in there. So it, it definitely worked. But these were mainly used as teaser posters uh, during the whole process. So then, um, of course, the international version uh, was three and a half hours. We uh, had two versions, so one of two hours, no, one on, an, uh, on, yeah, it was about one and a half hour and the other one two hours. And uh, obviously, I don't know, anyone here saw Nymphomaniac, the long version? Fantastic. So you know exactly what was cut out and probably also why it was cut out. So everything was actually in the campaign about trying to get a film financed, first of all, with the help of media that does not support porno, uh, pornographic movies, and uh, trying to still keep as close to the feeling of Lars and his film and what he wanted to do in the international version. We called it international version, and then we afterwards chose to call the long version director's cut. We discussed that for a long time, whether it was a good idea to call it director's cut, because, I mean, who wants to see a not director's cut, I mean, if they know the director's cut is going to come out at some point. So we tried to keep the director's cut as long as we could uh, and just focus on the international version. But Lars had one wish, and that was, whatever you do, I just want that it's my version, the long version of five and a half hours that goes to a festival. That's very important for him. So we said, okay, let's do this uh, compromise. We released the international version, which was a shorter one, three and a half in all. December, a true Disney movie for the audience, um, on the 25th of December in, Jan uh, in uh, Denmark. And then in all over the world, it was uh, released pretty much from January to April uh, this year, actually. Um, and then we uh, started, well, actually I should wait with that so we don't get messed up here. I will just come back to what I, I talked about. But um, in terms of the press strategy, uh, we discussed whether we should uh, do kind of like a countdown for the film. And we decided it would be a good idea for each chapter of the film to make some kind of... Uh, image or send out a still uh, to the press and we decided to make uh, exclusive content uh, for different outlets as you can see here each month before the release of the short version or the international version. Meanwhile we were always thinking about sending out press releases at least uh, a few a month with things happening during the shooting, uh, when the cast was available, where they were and what was happening. So it was a, an extremely uh, strong case and, and funny project to work on for us because we had so many stories to tell. And as you could see all of these uh, outlets here they agreed to do an exclusive. And that was also fantastic uh, marketing and press in that local territories because it felt like it was exclusive in that territory and they were the first ones to go out. The rest of the world came out, of course, just after, but uh, just having that tiny mo moment of ex ex ugh, exclusivity meant everything. Um, coming back to the festival strategy, um, we knew that Lars, uh, our persona non grata here, uh, he wanted his film uh, on a festival. And we talked to Lars a lot about the fact, should we go back to Cannes on our knees and just ask, why don't you take this version? And Lars was very clear about it. He did not want to put Thierry Frémaux in that position and say that he had to take in Lars. So we chose... Also, due to the fact that we released the international version in December 2013, that can, let's forget about it. And then uh, Louise West uh, spoke to Dieter Koslik from Berlin, uh, and he was uh, obviously very keen to, uh, to show the first, uh, I was about to say episode, but the first part of uh, the long version. And so we contacted Venice, uh, Alberto Barbera afterwards, and he said yes to showing the second version, or the second part of the long version, 
And uh, you could say that we actually dragged out the festival life into almost a whole year. At some point, we actually thought about also including Toronto and then making like a day and date release just after Toronto. But that was a little bit too hectic, but actually it was almost confirmed uh, at some point. Um, I think, you know, if you look at it, it was actually an amazing strategy, but seen from, you could say, a distributor's point of view, it was not perhaps the best strategy ever, going to Berlin with a director's cut once you are actually releasing uh, the internet or the, the short version or international version as we call it because of course you know the attention suddenly gets focused on the director's uh, cut so that was quite a challenge um, and when it comes to the long version I mean we wanted to put some new energy into this uh, director's cut and try to create new a new ambient and do something different. Uh, and some of, of the things that we did together with the distributors and in Denmark also was to do event screenings where you would have cast available, where you would do funny gimmicks and you would just, you know, have theme debates on nymphomaniacs, on abortion, on all kinds of uh, topics. And um, I just have a very short uh, presentation here for you in terms of the numbers that came out of it. I'm afraid to say they were not that impressive. Um, in Denmark, the short version made 50,000 admissions. Just for your information, Lars, he's not a hot shot in Denmark, nowhere near it. Uh, I mean, the biggest film from Lars made 100,000 admissions, and that was Dance in the Dark, and that was huge in Denmark for him. Uh, so this one here, compared to all the bus, I have to say, was not really worthwhile. We made a cinema event uh, screening two weeks uh, prior to the VOD release and had, you know, very little admissions. But then again, it's like the energy was taken out a little bit. In UK, um, actually, um, I think they did a very interesting thing because it was Artificial Eye Curson. Uh, that I think is a, an amazing company as well because they have the whole, you could say, system. They own the cinemas, uh, they have the distribution, and they have their own VOD uh, platform, making it so much easier for them to experiment with these day and day and premium VOD uh, experiments. Um, and we can learn a lot from that. But what they did is they took uh, the, in the international version and they played it uh, as a one night stand where you could see all of it together for a very short time. And then afterwards, uh, yeah, and then they did live streaming uh, Q&A with Stellan Skarsgård, Stacey Martin and Sophie Kennedy at the Curzon Chelsea. And what came out of that uh, was, uh, well, not an amazing box office, but again, we are talking uh, niche films here. Um, and uh, then around one week le later, they did separate screenings and they actually made, I think, an okay uh, result out of that. And then in March, uh, on March 1st, they made it available on selected VOD platforms like the ones mentioned here, Curzon Home Cinema, Sky Store, F Film Flex, BFA Player, Blink Box. Um, so, I mean, they did everything possible to create as much attention uh, out of this, and I think they did an amazing job. Um, I mean, it's probably, I'm happy that they have other films, but Nymphomaniac, otherwise they probably wouldn't have survived, but they did an amazing job. The long version, uh, they planned it, uh, well actually they wanted to show it at the same time as Denmark, but it was not possible to do that due to the classification, so it's coming out uh, early next year. And in the US, which I think is a, a very interesting case, because Magnolia, which we've been working with uh, for many years now on many films, they did on the short version, they uh, came out in March 13th at MoMA, in New York, and where you had cast members attending. And then two weeks after, no, that's one week after, they played the first theatrical, or the first volume theatrical on 25 screens in 15 top markets. 
and uh, expanding to another 100 markets throughout its runs. I mean, that's how it works in the US. They start out small and then they expand afterwards when the word of mouth, mouth is there. And after two weeks, they released the second part and uh, on 30 screens. Um, and the results, as you can see here, was actually that it did less on theatrical than on VOD, which is often the case uh, for Magnolia. And on the second one, uh, it was actually the same, almost, well, actually double up on VOD. And the long version, I mean, I have to say that was a true flop. When I got those figures, I got them yesterday from the long version, I, th I said to myself, Jesus Christ, what is happening here? 3,050 US dollars. Of course, this is 11 limited events, but still it was a disaster, I have to say. Um, and then 25,000 US dollars from VOD sales. But that was also due to the fact that, you know, they, they felt they had put all their, of course, marketing budgets into the international version, and this came out too, uh, too late. What they would have wanted is actually to go out uh, with the, the long version, but you know, in the first place. That would have worked be better in the US. Some good examples from earlier films and not Nymphomaniac uh, is uh, Melancholia. Um, that did an amazing theatrical box office of $3 million. And then, uh, actually, I think these uh, VOD grows here that I got uh, from Magnolia, I think they're too low. I think they're more than that, even closer to the theatrical box office. And then I think an interesting case that I took uh, is actually Into the White, which, which is a Norwegian film, English-speaking, uh, however, but uh, Peter Ness uh, is the director and it flopped big time internationally, but we sold it to Magnolia for a very small MG, and now we're seeing the first royalties coming in, because what happened is they put it out in theaters, they had a box office of 704,000 US dollars, but they also had it on VOD, uh, I think two weeks after, and had uh, 400,000 US dollars. So the reason why this was successful is because you had names like Rupert Grint, uh, from Harry Potter, if anyone remembers, and that just that was kind of like the search word that people went for. So it's specifically because it was English speaking and you had a known cast, it was actually uh, able to make these kind of uh, box office numbers. Um, and then what? Uh, yeah, that was into the white. Oops. So I mean. Talking in general about the market as we see it as a sales agent, um, you have the key factors uh, to success is to create a hype, create an expectation from buyers so that uh, they will know for sure when the film is coming out. As a Nymphomaniac, like I mentioned, that was sold probably on the first page that Lars wrote, not even the script. But then uh, that was at least to the loyal distributors, let's say 10 to 15 countries bought it. And then before we even released the film, the film was sold out a long time before. And that's not only because it's Lars von Trier, but because we succeeded in, uh, in creating this hype uh, and attention around it. Of course, we, the marketing material means everything when we're out there selling films. We have this uh, new apartment in Cannes uh, by the Croisette, and what we do is we just plaster the whole apartment in with marketing material and expectations. And uh, I mean, it's just so fun to work with when you look at a film and just taking out the selling points of this film. I mean, especially when you come from uh, countries like, uh, like we do, like Denmark and Norway and Sweden. Internationally, they see that as very exotic, uh, that you can see mountains and snow and exotic, exotic little rivers. So we play a lot on these sentiments uh, and things that people like internationally and why they think it's great to watch Nordic films. Um, so that's what we use in the marketing uh, material. Obviously, festivals are crucial for this uh, visibility and awareness uh, that we have internationally. And we use uh, the biggest festivals as our main, uh, you could say, selling tool, definitely. 
However, I think there is a change in terms of um, the interest uh, from buyers in, in festival films. So it's not longer enough you know, to be a first, second time director going for festivals because the buyers have lower budgets to buy for and they want to go for the bigger films. And that sometimes can be very hard as a sales agent to invest in, in new talent because it takes at least two to three to four films before you have uh, a success um, with this specific uh, director. Press, of course, reviews and exposure means everything. So um, sometimes when we have not sold a film in advance uh, and we're just waiting for the reviews, uh, we are slaughtered in the press and we have no argumentation or whatsoever to tell the buyers uh, when we have a, a bad review, what can you do about it? And another thing we also experience now is that the festivals are getting so big, so it takes longer time to get the reviews. For example, Toronto with over 300 films, it takes sometimes one week before you get a review on a film which is in the festival. And that means we sit there and we wait for the review and we can't really start dealing yet because of course, uh, the distributors and buyers, they're waiting for this review. And then the hype uh, and the word of mouth, uh, again, is everything. Sometimes we can start it ourselves. Sometimes it's uh, started by others. Uh, I mean, we have uh, fantastic experiences with, for example, Twitch that just picks up, you know, a word of mouth somewhere that this film is being made and they release, you know, a still or something they picked up from somewhere we don't even know about. And suddenly the whole, you know, uh, game and the whole, um, you could say, world of distributors, they know about this film. That is definitely the funniest part from, from seen from our perspective. Um, looking at our business, uh, I think it's interesting to see if you look at our turnover per year, actually uh, most of the turnover is made on uh, pre-sales. And that is, uh, pre by pre-sales I mean either films sold on script or promo. So what we do a lot is we make a promo uh, on a film, like two to three minutes, where we show the best from the film. And that would be during the production that we already dig into the script and say, okay, this and this works, you know, the buyers want to see this. And then we put together a, a two to three minute promo. And we invite all the buyers to sit in the same room, side by side, competitors, and look at each other. And then they look at this amazing promo and that's where they start buying the film. Um, and, and that's uh, really something that has changed in the last, I would say, five to seven years, that uh, the expectations are selling more than actually a finished film. Yeah, it's actually uh, rather weird. So, but one thing we have to is, if we do not keep up the quality and the level of the film, that will end, definitely. It's, uh, we are popular as long as we deliver. It's very, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get customers, uh, but it's very easy to lose them again. We have to remember that. And then just, uh, I think, finishing off uh, before you can just ask all the questions you want. Uh, I think uh, it's important to say that, you know, a few quotes that I like myself, that a festival for us is like your 15 minutes of fame. I mean, you've been working for so long and for the production companies and producers even longer, like three years time, and suddenly you have this moment where you walk up that red carpet and you just get, you know, acknowledgement from the world around you. And it's just remembering how much work is, uh, is done beforehand uh, and how little time you're up there. And uh, you only have one time to make a first impression and that's with everything you do uh, and also the marketing material and the whole positioning of the film. So once you sit there and you have to choose that first still in the marketing uh, material, you have to think so well about how you position this film to not only your local market, but the international market. I mean, we had the discussion with a film like The Hunt uh, that you probably saw, uh, some of you, uh, Thomas Winterberg's film that was in Cannes and Oscar nominated as well, whether we should profile this film as uh, 
a man uh, that was being stamped by somebody or something that you know was he was not guilty of, or whether it was actually a film about pedo uh, pedophilia. And uh, we thought so much about that one still, you know, that we had to go out with, and that is just so very important for every single film because it's going to hit you right back as a boomerang if you do something wrong there. And then. This is from our point of view uh, as uh, Trust Nordisk. Everything we wor work for is happening on the festivals. So on those, let's say, 20 very, very intensive days that we have in Berlin, in Cannes, Toronto, Venice, that is where we make 80% of our turnover. So um, it's very hectic. And uh, if you see us running around and looking very... Uh, stressed and uh, probably not recognizing who you are, then you know why. Uh, those are the 20 days that we have to deliver. And not meaning that we do not work other uh, days than the 20, but uh, this is just uh, where it all happens and where all the deals are signed. So um, please uh, ask ahead and uh, I'm there to answer the questions. Hello, um, thank you very much, it's very interesting um, also to see the figures. Uh, I was missing two things and I don't know if you can um, tell us some, if you have them in, you, in your head. So for instance, you gave a lot of box office um, figures, but um, against what kind of print and advertising costs? Because that was not the cost you as a sales agent would get. That's not even what the distributor would earn. I mean, he would, I don't know how much they invested, yeah. for instance, in the UK and in the US for print and advertising. That's one thing which was, yeah. would be interesting for me. Well, uh, absolutely. And uh, that's actually figures I would like myself. Uh, it's not always we get them. But um, normally, I mean, P&A uh, from, for example, I mean, normally you would compare them to the MG paid uh, but that's rare that it's that low. So let's say we get an MG in France for 300,000 euros. The P&A can go up to 1 million in P&A. So of course it will take a long time before we start seeing a dime uh, coming out of this film. And that's also some of the huge problems that we have, that we often have to think to take as uh, high and empty as possible, take the cash and run, because we're never going to see any royalties. But I think it has changed a little bit now. Uh, okay, the MGs have probably not gotten higher, that might be the reason, but we made films that actually made quite uh, great numbers, uh, like The Hunt has done successfully in Australia, in Benelux, uh, in UK, and we actually saw royalties coming back. The day we got the press release of the film was in Cannes, Obviously, uh, the prices went up sky high, and we got offers like we haven't seen for quite a while. Uh, but if you compare it to just 10 years ago, I think the MG level has def definitely diminished for Nordic normal films. But could you give an example for the 20 films per year you have? Um, like, let's say a guaranteed total worldwide from, let's say, I mean, there are for sure, in every hmm. territory, you have disasters where they make yeah. no profit and they go up. But, but what yeah, from? I can, it's difficult to give a worldwide of 20 films because it will not give you any knowledge. But I can tell you that we sell of the 20 films we sell, we might sell uh, two to three films that would make uh, a MG level of two million euros plus, and then you would have like uh, half of them making f between. 500,000 to 1.5 million euros. And then we would have, let's say, five to seven films that makes between 200 to 500,000 uh, euros in MG worldwide. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about PNA because each country has its own PNA. That would be from the MG level up to three times uh, the size. But what we do in the contracts is that we say that uh, if they do not come back to us with a PNA budget, then we will not accept a P&A higher than the MG they have paid us. So that's a way uh, for, for the distributor to feel pressured that he should deliver some numbers to us. 
but I have to say it's uh, it's stressful to think about that we don't get get all the figures that we ask for. Although in the contracts it says you know that we have uh, monthly state or not monthly but quarterly statements, and um, we wish we would have the same you know uh, visibility as for example media where you have like a last installment that you have to pay because then all the figures are coming. I remember one year I had I was uh, sitting in in media doing their uh, selective support um, as an expert, and you got this you got these bibles on the table where you had you know all the distributors what they paid in MD for all the films what they spent in PNA and a breakdown of the PNA budgets how much they used on you know all the single uh, things and you just felt oh my god i wish you know i could just remember these numbers when i walk outside that room because that would just make me a a very clever woman <laughs> but we couldn't we couldn't take our bags with us when we left for lunch <laughs> i have a question um, you said in the beginning vod is not replacing dvd as far as you notice not yet not yet. On the other hand, uh, I found the VOD numbers in comparison to the box office quite impressive. Yeah. Is that the case in all of your films or you just mm. chose the positive mm. examples? Yeah. Uh, I chose those examples because those are the ones where we actually have uh, figures where it's uh, reasonable. And the reason why it's US and UK is because Magnolia owns its own VOD platform. And Artificial Eye, Curzon owns its own VOD platform. And that's the reason why you see these high VOD figures. And I think that's something to talk about and also focus on, that you actually have very, very positive examples of premium VOD, where you actually pay quite a lot of money to see a film before the theatrical release, and you succeed in getting those numbers. Uh, but of course, being a cinema chain and not owning the VOD platform, I myself would sit there and say, so why should you take the money? I, I'm, I, I'm the cinema owner here, I should take it. But what I believe, seen from my point of view and looking at my own situation, I love cinema, I will never stop going to cinema, but I know the fact that I have two kids, seven and nine years old, I don't have time to go to cinema more than once a month. Uh, and if I could see the films that I would like to go to cinema to watch, but in my sofa and pay three times the price, I would do that. Because it's not really the money that is the issue, it's the time. I want to access it now, easy, and whatever device I like to use. And I think that's probably you know, the challenges we have today, that the users or the consumers, they are sometimes way ahead of the business. And, and what do they do if they cannot access that specific film? I mean, most of them, they, they are turning into pirates. And we don't like that. Yeah, but the interesting uh, thing then is, I don't know if distributors or uh, theatrical people of Germany are here, uh, the interesting clue then is really that um, the VOD cinema business should be in one hand in the end. Uh, not And then to yes. be able to experiment, to come closer between VOD and, and cinema. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Another question, um, last one I had was this uh, scheme you mentioned, um, the new world the cinema oh, the, yes, yes. Uh, scheme. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I mean, it's uh, a little bit vague still. Uh, is that actually developed uh, by you, by Trust Nordisk, or is that a group of uh, mm -hmm. sales agents doing that? Uh, who stands behind that? Wow, that's, um, that's actually a little bit secret now. I think we will launch it in Berlin. Uh, it's very, very, very new. It's also new to me, uh, but I, um, when I heard about it the first time, the first thing I thought is, but that's not going to work with the barriers and the frontiers. How are we going to do that? But if you can technically find a system where you can register the frontiers so that the rights holder get its money, which is absolutely necessary, I think it's an interesting case, you know, especially also because it's so difficult to find the niche films, the smaller films out there. It's easy to find the big ones on the front page of iTunes. Yes, sure. All the, the films that have been in the cinema. But what about the small, lovely festival darlings that we might not even have heard about. No, very interesting. It, it, in, a way it, uh, yeah. in a way, it commutes the, the model of social media into business, in a way. Which Absolutely, is, Which yeah. is really yeah. an interesting idea. 
Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so, now we come to the little cinema. Um, you will never forget to go into. John, it's your part, your stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening everyone. Um, thank you very much to the Academy, to Martin and Maria who's in here for inviting me. Um, I, I love Berlin, I come every Berlinale and it's interesting to be here Christmas time. It's usually no, not so cheery, Berlin, but you seem very happy. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our company, uh, Picture House Cinemas, what we do, what we're thinking about, where we're going, and hopefully that will trigger some debate. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about who I am. That's not me. Um, that's uh, Michael Mann. That's my favorite director. And um, I've been working with Picture House since 2004. I'm a frustrated filmmaker. And um, I worked for a little while in New York in film production. And uh, yeah, I just, I thought the world doesn't need another white male director, so I thought I'll take myself out of the game. Um, but um, I'm just going to tell you a story that starts with a very ugly building. This is um, Milton Keynes in the United Kingdom. It's called The Point, and in 1985 it was the first multiplex ever built in the UK. This was a, a very dark time, <laughs> and a galaxy very close to us actually. And um, at that point, there were only 50 million uh, cinema tickets sold in the UK. Uh, cinemas were closing on a weekly basis, and there was um, very little hope, and everyone thought it was the end of the world. And then um, the Americans came over, and uh, they started building multiplexes, and everything changed. Um, four years later, our company was created, Picture House Cinemas, and we started with this uh, cinema. It's built in 1913. Uh, it was an old abandoned cinema, which our founder, Lynn Golby and Tony Jones, uh, bought with, by remortgaging their homes um, and refurbishing it themselves overnight while they had day jobs, um, and created the Phoenix Picture House, reborn from the ashes very dramatically. Um, and based on this, uh, this first cinema in Oxford, which is a university town, you've probably heard of it from the colleges there, it's uh, the, the whole concept behind our company was created, which was to create cinemas that were the diametric opposition to what the multiplex culture was creating, which was big boxes outside of the city center that you had to drive to or that you had to walk through a shopping center and then when you'd come out it was like a scene from Dawn of the Dead because there was nobody there except some strange slow walking people. So it was trying to create a very lively, alive culture of a cinema that's on a street that you can walk to that feels like you can just walk out and jump on a bus and get home. Um, and it's very much also against the, the idea of the car culture, uh, which you know destroyed so many European cities in the 60s and 70s by creating um, urban environments that were only good places for cars. Um, and hope, thankfully, we're changing that now, not just through cinemas, but cities are realizing that everything needs to come back into the center. 25 years later, we have 21 cinemas in the UK. Um, each one of them is very much an individual business and uh, has a unique name, logo, identity, building. Um, every building that we occupy is different. The ones we build or convert or rescue, um, each has their own personality. And um, on top of our 21 physical cinemas, we also uh, provide programming services for 30 other cinemas, including uh, some you may have heard of, like the ICA in London, uh, the Phoenix in East Finchley, the Tyneside in Newcastle. These are some of the leading independent, truly independent cinemas. Uh, so we work with them. 
Um, we also have a distribution arm, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And we do uh, a lot of alternative content, which I'll also talk about in a moment. Um, this is, uh, I'll just, actually, you know what? Just identifying those cinemas. Uh, that's Hackney Picture House in East London. Uh, obviously, it says they're Greenwich. But that Hackney Picture House is a really interesting example of um, when we built this cinema in 2011, um, did you, you probably heard about the riots that happened in London in 2011. This street was uh, one of the most damaged streets during the riots. All these businesses were burnt. Uh, there were uh, cars burned, police cars. Um, and we were building inside while that was happening. And then three months later we opened. And Hackney is a completely different place now. And one of the things that we found in while building these cinemas is that the regen regeneration effect that cinemas can have in communities and town centers is incredible. Um, this is the uh, Cameo in Edinburgh, a beautiful 1920 cinema. Um, so what do we do? Uh, like I said before, each cinema is built from its roots. Uh, so what that means is we look at who lives in the area, uh, what type of people they are, what their interests are, are they old, are they young, is there a university, um, is there a lot of poverty, is it an affluent area, uh, do people drive a lot, do people use bicycles? And we try and build the cinema around the people that are there. We're not creating cinemas in a, in a bubble, in a void. These are cinemas for the people who live in that area. Um, we don't roll out a brand, so like I said, each cinema has its own personality and and, uh, and look. Um, each cinema is very much a hub of local activity. So we try and make them places that are not just cinemas, but they're also bars, cafes, kitchens. They're also uh, community centers. Uh, they're places where people meet. They're people, places where people come together, even if they don't want to watch a film. Um, I like to think that we're like Zelig. We, wherever, you know, wherever we can go, wherever we fit, we adapt to that. Um, okay, here's another lovely cinema. This is the Gate in Notting Hill, 1911. Um, this, uh, just talking a little bit about what our philosophy is. I talked about the opposition to the car culture. But how we deliver that is it's more important to communicate directly to our customers than it is to communicate our brand. So, you know, in modern brand culture, the name, the logo is everything. Uh, for us, that is, the, is secondary to that relationship that we can build with the, with the audience. Um, people have to trust their local cinema the way they can trust other local businesses. Um, the way you would have, perhaps in a pre-hypermarket era, you would have trusted your local butcher or your local fishmonger. Um, it's a place where you go, you're all, you know you're always going to have a good experience. Um, each cinema is run, I used to run one of these cinemas, I don't know if there's a picture of my old cinema, but um, you run it like it's your own business. The, the company very much gives you a long leash to uh, run away and do crazy things, and that's what we do. Um, everything we do is with the customer in mind, and it's about being flexible, lenient, as an example, our, our boss, Lynn, her favorite book is called Breaking All the Rules. So whenever she calls me and says, why did you do this? I say, well, you know, I read your book. Um, we break all the rules all the time because that's the only way to, to move forward. Um, this is the Ritzy in Brixton. Um, this is uh, an example, again, of a regeneration project that we worked with the local council in, in Lambeth to develop the square that you see where all these people are sitting. This used to be a very, I don't know if any of you know Brixton, but it's quite an interesting place. Um, that this square here, when I lived there 12 years ago, was uh, the gathering place for all the alcoholics in the, uh, in, it seems, all of the world, um, where they would throw rocks at you as you walk by. Now it's a beautiful little square, and it was all due to working with the local uh, council to develop the cinema into a hub for the community, a place that people felt like they owned. Um, so, how do we develop audiences? Um, as I said, flexibility, adapting to each market, finding mar through market research areas where there's a gap. So, are there, is this an area with lots of families? Do we need to do more family screenings? Um, 
creating sense of excitement. So up in this part up here, there's a little venue called Upstairs at the Ritzy, which does uh, concerts, stand-up comedians, and it's completely separate business in a way. It's, it's owned by the cinema and it's part of our company, but it, there's a, it has its own little manager who runs events in a space very much like this, it have talks, presentations. And so people are coming into the building all the time, even if they've never been to an art house cinema or an art house, to see an art house film. And you're creating a sense of familiarity and comfort so that the first step, the most important one that people take in art house, is the first step through that threshold into an art house cinema because sometimes they feel that they don't belong there. So always creating events around the cinema that make it a welcoming place regardless of what's on your calendar. Um, creating national and regional partnerships. Uh, I work a lot with the BFI on the Film Audience Network, which is a new initiative to create a network of exhibition to develop audiences for British independent and foreign language. Um, am I going too fast? Okay, just checking. Um, oh, I've gone too far. Okay, so um, in terms of developing niche audiences, not all audiences are created equal. So there's many cliches about who goes to see art house uh, films. Sometimes people say it's all old people or it's all art students. But actually we find in our cinemas that all kinds of people come into our cinemas and, um, and we've created little, cl little clubs for all of them. So um, I'll just go through these. Silver screen, as you can imagine, older people. Uh, <laughs> After Dark, for the young, cool crowd who want to see late night movies. Culture Shock, for cult, rare B movies. Big Scream, for uh, babies under one year old. They come with their parents, don't worry. Uh, screen Arts is a, the alternative content strand. Discover Tuesdays is like a, a, a very small film that struggles to receive wide distribution. Uh, every Tuesday evening there's a screening of, of a film like that. These are screenings for um, children and their uh, children on the autism spectrum who struggle sometimes to watch films in a, in a normal uh, environment. So we create a safe environment to, for them to come to the cinema. Obviously our documentaries, screen talks, kids club for children three to 12, and then toddler time, which is uh, for children two to five. So these are actually TV programs like, um, what's, a, what's a popular TV program? What's the, the Teletubbies, is that a thing? Yeah. <laughs> So we will show them Teletubbies in the cinema, <laughs> little half hour programs, they come with the, because what happens is they come to the one with the parent, the baby one, and then until here, there's like a five year gap where those children, those, um, not the children really, it's the parents, have nothing to, they can't come to the cinema. So we've created this middle one, so basically from when they're born till closer to the end, <laughs> we've created a sort of cl cradle to grave uh, but cradle to, not grave, cra cradle to end, cradle to near winter. Anyway, um, film quizzes, blogs, podcasts, all that, I mean, all the usual channels that you would find. But the idea behind this is just, it's, uh, you might not be interested in, um, you, might, you, might hate the, you might hate the sound of children screaming, that's fine, just don't come on Wednesday morning. Uh, but you might love late night movies, so we've got something for you. So the idea is just creating different channels. I mean, the segmentation of content is obviously something that's already happening through the internet and, and through you know 100 channels on TV. So why shouldn't it exist in your physical venues? Um, food and drink, very important part of everything we do. Um, not just because it makes a lot of money, because it does, but also because it creates a third space between the home and work where people can come and spend some time without the pressure of having to watch a film, without having to stand in line. Just come, hang out. If you watch a movie, you watch a movie. If not, we got your money anyway. Um, but, it's, uh, but, it, but these are very important and every new cinema that we're building will, comes with a, a kitchen because we want to be able to provide food. We operate all of these ourselves. We don't uh, do franchises. We don't you know, r rent them out to Starbucks or something like that. It's about creating uh, a space that's coordinated with uh, your cinema offer. 
Okay. Uh, distribution. So we do about six to seven releases a year. Um, these are some of the films we've released, although we've done many more. Uh, 20,000 Days was uh, sort of our big film in 2014. Um, a lot of it is documentary. Uh, our first real big film was Herzog's Cave, um, but we do also some American indies, a lot of cinematic style documentaries. We've just released a, a film about Hockney, David Hockney. Um, and we started this only four years ago, so we're still, we're still getting to grips with it. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about a case study of a film that we released uh, last year called The Field in England. Uh, it's, um, it's a really small film by Ben Wheatley who uh, directed Kill List, Sightseers, maybe you've heard of him. He's a really exciting new British director. Um, and when we, when we acquired this film, the, the challenge was to do something different with it because Really, this film is so small, and if you've, has anyone seen this film? One, one person, there you go. It's the smallest film you could imagine. One person has seen it. <laughs> oh, fuck. Um, it's, a, but it's a beautiful film, but it's very experimental. It's non-linear uh, non narrative, it's black and white. It's about the civil war in England. Some people don't even know there was a civil war in England, I didn't know. Um, it's, it's this bizarre film, it's surreal, it's very Nicholas Rogue inspired. Um, but this would very much struggle to find the, a mainstream audience or a wide audience. So in collaboration with the BFI, we uh, did an experiment which was to release the film not just in cinemas and in VOD, but also on TV for free at the same day that it was in cinemas, which was really the first time that had ever happened. Um, and um, there's a really interesting report that the BFI prepared for this that you can find online, it's free, uh, called the uh, BFI Insight Report Field in England. It'll be the first result. Um, where it, it breaks down in detail all the qualitative and quantitative research they did around it. Um, what we found basically is the thing that we knew would happen is that more people knew about this film uh, because of the way we released it um, than they would have otherwise. So you had all the publicity of it being aired on film four, and you can see almost a million people watched it on TV, um, opening in 17 cinemas, um, sold a lot of, I mean, DVD and Blu-ray sales, as you know, are decaying, uh, de declining, and these are really good sales for a film of this kind. Um, and actually, the VOD figures, meh. So the event was really exciting, and a lot of the box office, um, as you can see there, from the, the one night, it is a huge amount, which kind of reflects a little bit what you were talking about in Infomaniac, is that the event is the thing. Um, this is some of the other alternative content that we release. Some of it we, so we, with about six, seven years ago, we started doing alternative content uh, before anyone else in the UK. And uh, we built a relationship with the Met Opera and with National Theatre. And, um, and then we became co-producers with the National Theatre of their live stream. And now we serve as agents in the UK. So we sell all the no National Theatre content. We also produced uh, the David Bowie live at the v &A. We have the rights to the Royal Shakespeare Company. And we recently acquired the global rights for Monty Python live at the O2. Um, and then we've done things with the BBC like the Doctor Who, which I know happened here in Germany as well. Um, and this is now probably about 20% of all our business is all this alternative content. And it isn't just opera and theater. It's also cool events like Bowie, like Doctor Who. And it's bringing in very uh, new audiences. So what's happening with alternative content? Well, it's always growing very fast. Um, now pretty much every art house or independent cinema in the UK now does some form of alternative content. Um, you can see just from 2012, there was a 140% increase, and we expect it to double next year as well. Um, so what can, what, I think the, the key thing is, is, is if, if you're concerned with film and the future of cinema and what is, what's gonna happen with all these films that are not getting released and getting kicked out by theater uh, and opera, is that to look at the lessons from uh, what is it that these things are representing. They're representing, I think, a desire from 
our audiences to see something special, unique, live, excitement. So how do we do that? Um, well, one of the things that we're doing, for example, that we did with 20,000 Days is a event release modeled on what you would do with alternative content except with film. So for 20,000 Days, um, we did a live Nick Cave concert, Nick Cave Q&A, and screening at the Barbican in London. And we broadcast that live to 150 cinemas across the country. Um, and then what happened after that is that the, the one night, the 150 cinemas produced a lot of box office, 240,000 of the half a million total. And that's, obviously that's 50% of the lifetime box office of this, of this film. Because when it went on release, it only went to 40 cinemas. Because it's a small movie, it's a documentary. So how can you maximize the impact of a documentary like that? The only way is through an event. The only way is to utilizing the talent and the asset. And in this case, the asset is Mr. Cave. Look at him, he looks like the devil, doesn't he? And then we did the same with two other films. Um, very similar in a way, The Stone Roses, another music uh, documentary. We did a concert with The Stone Roses, a Q&A from Manchester, uh, and 50% of the box office. And you can see the drop off. So it goes from 200 screens to 80 prints, because really, it's an 80 print movie. But because of the event, because people want to see The Stone Roses, it goes to 200. Um, Zizek, uh, we did half of, you know, because people want to hear him talk. That's what, you know, he's a rock star philosopher, so what do you want to do? You want to hear him say crazy things. So you, you, the, the, big, the big event is him in Q&A, because it's amazing. Of course, the film's great and fantastic, et cetera, but the event creates a, an excitement that you would never be able to generate from a documentary uh, or an essay film like Pervert's Guide. Um, do I have anything else to say? Ah, yes. Okay, so those are the ways in which we work in cinemas, but we're also thinking about ways in getting to places where we don't have cinemas, because there's more people out there than we have cinemas for. So one of the ways that we've thought of um, doing this is we've just bought this truck, which sits 100 people in it. It opens up and turns into a, a mobile cinema, and it has full DCP projection in it, so you can show new releases on date. You could park this in a town that has no cinema and show a film. You could show Mr. Turner the day it opens. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and we've started, it's rolling out in February, and we're going to start um, taking it to festivals, but also just little towns that perhaps don't have a cinema or have a cinema that isn't showing any interesting content. We're thinking about how uh, to bring the picture house to your town. Um, and another way we're doing that is through our screen, which is a new platform that we've released, uh, which is a cinema on demand platform. You may have heard of Tug in America and in the Netherlands they have We Want Cinema. And essentially it's a critical mass tool. So um, there's a catalog of about 400 films and it's all kinds of films from, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know who booked that, but um, Scarface and Under the Skin, you know, classics, contemporary, family films, classics. So, um, you know, 400 films to choose from, many of them uh, brand new releases. So, for example, when 20,000 Days came out, it went on to our screen the day after it came out in cinemas. And the idea is you, you choose a film, you choose a cinema, and then you tell all your friends, and if enough people pre-book a ticket, reserve a ticket, the screening happens. If the screening happens, your money comes out of your card. If it doesn't happen, your money goes back. Um, and so far, we're having a lot of success with it. It's uh, rolled out into 25 cinemas across the UK, including all picture houses. And the idea is to just hand over, if you want to find out what your, what your audience wants, <laughs> well, this is the easiest way to do it. You just actually give them control. They choose a slot, they pick their film, and off they go. Um, and it's still in its initial stage, but I think both this and the truck that we've bought are ways of finding what's, what's happening next. I mean, our physical venues are the heart of our business and we'll always continue to have them. And in fact, we're building 
uh, right now four more cinemas in the UK. But but I think it's important to always just kind of um, take a chance on a next project, see what's around the corner, and hopefully preempt what might be happening. And I think that's everything. And there's a good there's a good hold on there's a good picture. Questions? <laughs> Say that's a, those are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, gibt es Fragen direkt zu Johns Vortrag? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thanks for your presentation. I have a question to your groups and club slide, you know, the um, yeah. great cradle to grave. You know. uh, as a private podcaster, what do I need to do to go into your podcast club to get into your cinemas? Well, it's not really a club. The podcast is, is just a podcast that is recorded every week by two guys who work in the cinema um, and uh, yeah they interview you know so it's kind of like a complimentary marketing oh. thing so every week if there's a Q&A in one of the cinemas the guys will go down to the cinema and interview the director and the star or so on and then it'll go up so it, it's sort of accompanying mm. material so there's not really a podcast club although I used to record a podcast you remember back then we yeah. all used to record podcasts Like three years ago, everyone had a podcast. It's, no. it's just coming back. It's just oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's finally here. But uh, one more question: Is it? Yeah. Um, would you invite like local like podcast people mm. and make him like make him have a live show so that people who only know them from their voice can actually see them? Yeah. In Germany, you have that with audio books. Yeah, yeah. Where people come and read them there. It's a good idea. We um, the the Picture House podcast, the official Picture House podcast, is. Um, hosts like an annual screening where they'll show their favorite film of the year or a film they want to show and they'll sit on stage and record a podcast with the audience which is great yeah and also when I worked at the Duke of York's I used to invite uh, podcasters to do live shows because sometimes comedians have really great podcasts and you and I, I don't listen to music anymore I only listen to podcasts so I would just get them to do a live show with some kind of thing going on in the background so yeah it's one of the many kind of events that we do sometimes in cinemas. Awesome. But yeah, it's a good idea. Cool. cool. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, Florian Körner, producer from Berlin. I just wonder concerning those clubs in the cinema, are the people really following those clubs? Means they're going to the cinema without knowing which movie exactly is showing? Because what I learned from Art House Cinemas here in Berlin is that even if it's a very specific Art House Cinema, people are still following up the lineup concerning, so they, they make up their mind what kind of movie, which movie they're going to see. Mm. And so is it different? Yeah, well, it depends which club. So, for example, the um, obviously, you know, more popular movies have more audiences always. You know, that's always the say. But um, a couple of those strands, like the Discover Tuesday one, every Tuesday evening, it's it's a very very niche film. You know, that usually won't get a big release. That is the one where we see that people. There's always pretty much the same uh, amount of people coming. The other one that's very regular is the Silver Screen one. Um, for the older audiences, because it's usually, it's more about convenience for them. So every, say, Tuesday morning at 11 a.m., there's a film on for them, and they get, like, a free tea and coffee, and they come. So they, they're not think you know, the, the, the content for them is secondary, because they're probably meeting all their friends every week, and then afterwards they sit in the bar and talk. Um, and same thing with kids' clubs. So when anything to do with families, children are a little less... What's the word? Picky. <laughs> you know, they just want to go to the movies, have a great time. But of course, when there's a big family movie, you get that regular base, and then you get on top of that the casual crowd. So I think all the clubs have a core constituency, a core membership, and they actually have all member membership cards that say, I'm a member of the Silver Screen, or I'm a student member, I'm a... Blah. And those people always come no matter what. And then on top of that is your cat. You know, it's like in a gym, uh, when, you know, gym business model where you have this, the core centric user and then you have casual users and then you have people who never use it who are financing the people in the middle. That's usually how it works. 
Who is uh, actually curating the programs? Is it the, the manager who is responsible for each cinema? Or is it does, uh, are you doing it central? How is that working? Um, so there's a team of about 10 programmers in our head office in London, and each one of them is assigned a few cinemas, depending on their uh, strengths, capabilities. Each one of our programmers has a sort of specialty. So we have someone who's uh, very much a documentary person. We have someone who uh, knows the classics. We have this person who's in charge of cult. Um, so they have their areas of a specialty, but they also have their specific cinemas. And then it's a relationship between them and the manager. To The manager's job is to give the programmer the uh, frontline information about what the customers are saying, uh, what audiences are asking about, um, and obviously it's the manager's job to make sure that we deliver the marketing on the ground for each one because each film has a campaign attached to it, especially if it's a film we're releasing. The campaigns are designed with the cinemas in mind um, so that it's all you know, delivered uh, and it's all integrated. So the, the short answer is central. No more questions? The club seemed to be a very popular topic. Um, as a distributor, do you do things differently than others? I mean, maybe as a cinema exhibitor, you sometimes are not satisfied with the work of distributors, so now you are distributing yourself. Is it just films which other distributors don't pick up, or do you try different things distributors don't do? No, I think... Um, it's not about picking up films that don't um, that nobody else is picking up because we often fight other distributors for our films and sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Um, but uh, I think the idea is to pick up films that we think suit our audience. So it's always thinking about who is the picture house, the core picture house audience, if you were looking at that circle again. And I think the films that we release in general Films like 20,000 Days, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, um, are, are suited for, you know, not, not, not a young audience, but sort of, you know, a 25 to 40 uh, educated city audience. And that's the core. If we can, if we can uh, cross those films over into other audiences, then that's even better. Um, but yeah, there's, um, I think there's a huge attraction for exhibitors to cut the distributor out of the way because we can, you know, we don't have to pay, <laughs> so we pay ourselves the distributor And fee. would you work with other cinemas as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. So our films go to uh, lots of other cinemas, yeah, absolutely. Would you say that the success of that period movie was something you had on mind or did you expect more concerning the cinema distribution? Sorry, which movie? Uh, the period one, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the... Oh, a field in England. The field in England, yes. Well, I think it's a success in, its, in the context of that movie. It's not, a, you know, it's not a box office hit, like you saw. Only that guy saw it. So I think the, the film, uh, you, you, know, you have to measure it within... The, and also, it wouldn't have been possible to do that without support from the BFI, who contributed significant P&A funding for it. Um, it was very much an experiment that they wanted to do, and that we were able to collaborate with uh, them on. And I don't think that's the right way to release all films. I think it's each film has to be considered uh, on its own merits. And, um, and I think we do need to push the envelope and we need to change the way we do things. But I think lots and lots of films still uh, benefit from a good long window. Of course they do. Uh, but, uh, but in this case, it, it was, I think it was the perfect uh, model for that film. So you would do it again? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with the right, with the right film. So we, um, uh, all our films, are, we don't have a policy. So Curzon, for example, have day and date pretty much on all their films. We don't. We have some have windows, some have a shorter window. It depends on our strategy for each film. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, I have a couple to both of you in a way. I don't know, uh, should we sit on, just come up? One reason uh, why we put both of you, or the, uh, the part of the business you are representing, together was uh, an ongoing discussion I have with uh, Maria 
um, and that is, the, um, of course, what is happening in the future. And we agreed when we had dinner tonight that everybody who is telling you or telling us what is happening in five years uh, is not telling the truth, is a liar, uh, because nobody really knows. But uh, one trend uh, I'm discussing a lot with, uh, discussed a lot with Maria was um, what is happening between actually the producer and the theatrical release in the next years. Um, a very radical thesis says, okay, with the internet, with the digitalization, with all the the direct ways, so to say, from post-production house into the theaters, do we really need all these middlemen? And um, so you are not a middleman, you are just at the end of the chain. Uh, I'm a producer, there are lots of producers. She's and in the middle, literally. Yeah. No, yeah. not really. No, no, that's, we didn't want to invite anybody who we tell, well, your times are over. Uh, no, actually, we, uh, uh, we think that, I mean, you are working very close uh, with uh, Centropa. So in a way, uh, we see Nordisk, I mean, you, you do a lot of things, but concerning the, the case study, we, we actually see the producer is starting the distribution already, I mean, when he writes the script. Is that the trend we are going to see, that we will have much more uh, close relations from the production directly into the market? And if you I shouldn't ask you what is happening, but if you just try to, how does it look concerning this relation in five years? What do you think? Will I produce a film and rent it directly to the cinemas, which are fitting into it, maybe with an agency in between with people who do it? Will I put it into the market, as you say, in this vague model you will introduce that actually recipients, I mean, the audience picks the film up and distributes it and takes a share within its core group? I mean, what is happening there? Well, I think it's it's a very relevant question, and I think uh, being an international sales sales agent or a local distributor, one should really think about its role and what you do to justify the fact that you're actually a middleman and you you take commission. It's a fact. So, I mean, from a local point of view, of course, you know, the physical distribution was so obvious at the time. You actually have to transport a DVD to the shops and video stores. Now everything happens digitally, so what is the effect of a distributor? So, I mean, looking at, for example, at Nordisk Film, of course they have a huge know-how, I have to say, uh, from a digital point of view, both in terms of, of formats, that's one thing that's not rocket science, but the fact that they are so big as they are, they have a bargaining power towards uh, huge players like iTunes, Netflix, uh, HBO, Viaplay, the names of, uh, of the VOD platforms in the Nordic countries. And that means that Nordisk Film is able to say, you know, this is the price you have to pay for this film if you want it. As a producer, you would have to sit there as the little man and say, well, I think my, my film is worth this and that. And being, I mean, content is king. It's a fact. So if you have all the content, then you can set the rules. That's from a local perspective. However, I think it's very important to point out that the um, working with the producer is essential because nobody knows the film and the project like, like a producer. I can tell you that this campaign was produced mainly by the production offices together with Trust Nordisk, but a little bit by Nordisk Film, but it would never have been as strong without the participation uh, of uh, the producer, never ever. As a sales agent, you could say the reason why we exist and probably, I hope, will do in the future is because it's, uh, first of all, uh, to be able to sell international, it, it's very costful. You have to be everywhere uh, where it happens and it's, it costs a lot to be at a festival stand, uh, representation, uh, all the sales team that has to be there, uh, so many things going on and then you have to have this huge network. So what we live from is actually the network, it's not anything else than that. We live from knowing around three and a half, four thousand people uh, that we have to nurse every day uh, by taking them out to dinners, writing emails, supplying them with, you know, with uh, all kinds of information. And I think if a producer has to do that 
themselves. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would want to watch the next movie uh, from that producer because, I mean, then I think the quality was t would just go down. So it's like, do what you do best. Yeah, um, yeah I think, I think the, the current ecosystem of um, having a distribution um, sort of environment, sales agent and distribution environment is necessary to an extent. I think that, you know, if we, I think, in the UK, it's different in different markets, isn't it? So in the UK, we had 698 films released last year. That's too many movies. Um, and who, you know, whose fault is that? Well, partly um, there's a lot of public funding going into films that shouldn't be made. Uh, partly there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of public money going into PNA funds for films that shouldn't be released, or that should be released in realistically. Maybe they don't need theatrical releasing. Um, maybe they can go on a platform where if people really want to see them, they can organize it themselves. I think um, it's very difficult as an exhibitor when you have 15 movies a week opening and you only have a handful of screens to handle that type of volume. Um, so I think there does need to be some consolidation in the more mature markets. Of course, if you go to Latvia, for example, uh, they have, you know, they have like no films. Uh, they're struggling to get films. Um, and major distributors see them as just an appendix of Russia and therefore they just sell the rights all at once and it's a, it's a nightmare for those sort of less mature markets. So it doesn't apply in every place. But certainly in the UK, uh, there's been models where there have been films for, you know, and I, I, I come back to the hour screen model. There's a very small film that was made in, in Brighton, the city I live in. Uh, by some local filmmakers. They were never going to get distribution. It's a tiny film. And um, they essentially just used the platform to self-distribute. And they were able to go into 25 cinemas with no p &A budget other than their goodwill and their stars, who one of them was on True Blood, so kind of famous, tweeting about it all the time. Uh, and, and, and that got people out. And all they did was they made a poster and a trailer. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, for certain, obviously you can't do that with an infomaniac. You need, uh, you know, a, a, a strategy. You need a budget. You need assets. You need, you know, a, a huge amount, an infrastructure there to deliver that. And um, you can't rely on individual exhibitors to do that. So, yes and no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but a very simple question to you, John. Then why is a theatrical company becoming a distributor? I mean, if everybody should do what he can do best or she can do best, uh, why do you turn into a distribution company? Um, well, it's a small part of our business, and I think it's um, is what I would say. We wanted to get... I think we saw so many films... I think so, <laughs> we saw so many films that we thought were perfect fall apart in the hands of a distributor who didn't handle it right. That we thought, well, the next time we can do that and we can do it much better. And I think we do do it better in some instances. We can't, you know, we can't release uh, Hunger Games, nor do we want to. Uh, what we can do, though, is we can handle a film like 20,000 Days and maximize its potential so that it'll, it'll achieve what it probably wouldn't achieve with a different type of distributor. Uh, because, you know, I mean, vertical integration was, is the thing that built the, the, the global film industry. In the beginning, it was you know it was the old Hollywood barons who owned production, distribution, and exhibition until it was broken up in the late 40s. That's how the global industry was built. I mean, in France, to an extent that exists still, um, and that's. I'm not saying that we should all do that, but there are huge virtues to owning, like you said, owning the whole line, um, allows you to create leverage and economy of scale that you can't get when there's so many players that need to be paid. Uh, one more question. Um, both of you spoke a little bit about channeling, about finding the niche audience properly. And we hear a lot about uh, what Netflix and the other platforms, the aggreg aggregators are doing now with their big data. I mean that uh, they really try to find for each person, each subscriber, exactly the films they want to see. Uh, does the data you collect or you get from your distributors you sell the film to, uh, does that play a role in your, in your work now, especially, of course, uh, 
with the data you get from your theaters, do the, uh, the, the web pages of your cinemas play a role in it? Um, how are you dealing with that? Social networks, big data, etc. Okay. Um, well, it's, I, I would like to say that it's very scientific and that we use all the data very accurately. But I think even people like Amazon and Netflix, I don't think they know what they're doing yet because if anybody here uses Amazon, you, how many times a day are you recommended a piece of garbage that you would never buy? This algorithm is so smart. Why does, how does it not know what I want? Um, I think we're still far from understanding exactly. I mean, Netflix also, it recommends nothing but garbage to me. I never want to watch what Netflix wants me to watch. Um, I always have to look for it. So, um, so if they can't figure it out, what chance does anyone else? Of course we look at data and research and everything, but ultimately our acquisitions team, when they're looking at a film, they have to believe in it, in their gut and in their heart. Um, and when we, um, when we sell the film in the cinema, uh, we might have some data behind us and that's a tool, but ultimately I think there is, um, we know our audience instinctively. So when I worked in a cinema, I thought I had in my mind always like these 10 people that I always saw coming into the cinema. You know, some were old, some were young, but they were always there. And I always thought, what do they think? And it's very unscientific, it's anecdotal, it's worthless scientifically. But I feel like that was enough for me to understand what we were doing. So the short answer is no, we don't look at data. The short answer here is we look at the box office, admissions, track record of directors, festivals and so forth, and that's what we base, you could say, the choices of the future of. Okay, thank you. One last chance for questions in public before we have a get-together and maybe one or two questions from you guys. No? Okay, then maybe with a glass of wine. We all invite you to, and uh, thanks again, the two of you, for coming. <laughs>